Now, Father, we pray your blessing on our time together that we would be edified, built up in the faith as we consider the truth of your word and understand uh, the purpose of prophetic scripture. We pray as well for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We pray for the redemption of the Jewish people. And we pray your protection over the nation, Israel. We pray that you bring confusion to the minds of the enemies, that you destroy the organizations of Hezbollah, Hamas, and others, but deliver the Muslim people from the domain of darkness, we pray. Guide us now in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, as we've been considering how to share our faith with Jewish friends, neighbors, etc., uh, we got to session seven, uh, talking about the issue of prophecy, using and abusing it. Uh, last week, the screen you see above me is what we covered last week. Uh, it'll be our jumping off point. But before we do jump off, I want to mention something. There seemed to be some misunderstanding uh, about certain words that I used last week. I tried to clarify it once or twice. Uh, the three words all start with T, so that could be part of the problem. Uh, the three words are Tanakh, Talmud, and Targum. Uh, and let me just explain the difference between those three words. The word Tanakh uh, deals with the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and it's a, a, an acrostic uh, from Torah, Nevi'im, Ketovim, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Uh, and so that is an acrostic referring to the Hebrew scriptures, Tanakh. The word Talmud uh, is the rabbinical codification of the oral law. It's the rabbinical codification of the oral law that was uh, uh, started around 200, uh, uh, of the, uh, 200 AD. Uh, and it it's a vast accumulation of uh, the teachings of rabbis over hundreds of years. Uh, and it's a lot of information. I'm using some of it um, the, during this uh, course. Uh, the Talmud, uh, the rabbinical uh, writings, are not inspired. They are religious writings, like other religious writings. The reason that I utilize them is not because our faith is based on the authority of Talmud at all. Just to show one simple point, that where uh, they speak about the Messiah, as I've noted for you, and have up there as well, from Sukkah 52 A and B, it shows that our faith in Yeshua the Messiah is not a non-Jewish idea. It is a Jewish way of looking at things. That's why I utilize the Talmud. Please do not think uh, we place any authority for our faith or salvation in rabbinical writings. We do not. We do not. That's the word Targum. Uh, that's the word Talmud. The word Targum means uh, translation. It's used for the paraphrase translation used in the first century in Judea and, and the Galilee, uh, which was an Aramaic translation of the Hebrew scriptures. The word Targum means a translation. Talmud is rabbinical writings. Tanakh are the Hebrew scriptures. I hope that's clear. The Hebrew scriptures are inspired. Uh, the Targum is as inspired as any translation can be. It reflects upon the, the scriptures, uh, etc. Uh, so we want to be understanding of that matter. As we move on now, uh, from this point, let's continue our considerations. So I write down your questions. Uh, you know, we really encourage people to have questions. That's how you learn. When I speak, you know where I'm coming from. When you ask questions, now I know how to minister to you uh, to address some of your issues. So we encourage questions. Uh, as we consider the matter of uh, prophecy on this regard uh, and how to use it in our witness, 
interpretation witness, a rabbinical interpretation of scripture in general uh, and any of the prophecies we look at in particular, the interpretation is based on traditional understanding. Uh, the Pharisees, uh, from you've read about them in the New Covenant, uh, they are the ones who wrote what we have as Talmud and other rabbinical writings. Uh, this has to do with their understanding of their authority uh, to interpret the Bible uh, truly, and I, we don't accept their we don't accept their authority to do so. Uh, and so this is how the rabbis interpret things. Uh, we utilize it for the sake of our witness, but we do not depend on their interpretation. We do not hold or agree with their authority on the matter. And the reason is any, anyone who denies Yeshua to be the Messiah is automatically a false teacher, period. Uh, so they do not accept Yeshua as the Messiah, I therefore don't think their teaching is going to be anything but false. Uh, regarding Messianic believers, we take the Bible for what it says. A literal or natural interpretation, we just take the Bible for the way it reads. We consider it all about Yeshua. Uh, we consider the whole Bible to be about Yeshua. This is what the Bible itself teaches us. John chapter 5, verse 39, saying to religious folks, he said, you search the scriptures thinking in it, in it you have eternal life, but it is of me of which it speaks. And so Yeshua made it very clear that the scriptures speak of him. It's about him. When we interpret the scripture, we are on safe ground when we try to understand how it reflects upon him, since he tells us he is the key to all scripture. Uh, he is the incarnate word. The scriptures as such are the inscribed written word. When we use prophecy, and you'll know this uh, under C on your outline, I have one simple little statement there which summarizes a whole lot of things. We uh, always uh, utilize the plain meaning of the text. Let me explain what I mean by that. There are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies of the Messiah in the Hebrew Scriptures. Hundreds of prophecies uh, in the Hebrew Scriptures. Some of them are very clear and obvious. Some are not clear and not obvious at all. Some of them we only know as prophetic because of how the New Covenant interprets it, such as in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, it says, out of Egypt I called forth my son. We may not pay much attention to that, except that in Matthew chapter 2, Matthew tells us it was referring to the Messiah. I would never have guessed that if Matthew hadn't told me. <laughs> and, but it's authoritatively speaking of Messiah, because Matthew is inspired scripture. But when I am witnessing to people, who do not accept the new covenant as authoritative. I do not show them Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 and say, you see, Messiah. Out of Egypt I called forth my son. They say, what makes you think that's Messiah? Now I have to give a whole uh, lot of explanation on what makes me think it's about Messiah. So I do not use prophecy that is not clear and obvious on the plain reading of the word. For instance, Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, are you familiar with Isaiah 53? If you are, raise one of your hands, either one will do. I don't care which one. Familiarize yourself with Isaiah chapter 53 because on the plain reading of the scripture, it's very clear of whom it speaks. I have utilized that portion of scripture many, many, many times 
and had many Jewish people just in reading it, recognizing it is speaking about Yeshua the Messiah. Absolutely. You have to be taught differently in order to misunderstand that point. Uh, and so uh, most Jewish people are totally unfamiliar with it. They've never read it. It doesn't come up in synagogue readings whatsoever. Uh, and so they're unfamiliar. And so it, uh, if you get a chance to share it with a, a pre-believing Jewish person, uh, it'll be most helpful because the plain meaning, the plain reading of it, the Peshat, as we say in Hebrew, the plain reading of it is a clear testimony as a prophecy. Whereas others that I've alluded to and noted for you are not clear. Now, there are some that I can teach uh, about how it is the Messiah. But then they would have to believe on my authority to teach. They'd have to accept my authority as a teacher. Uh, rather than the plain, plain meaning of the text, you see? And so I use those prophecies that are just dealing with the plain meaning of the text when I share with pre-believing Jewish people. In regards to using rabbinical writings, you'll notice on your outline on page 7, uh, you'll notice at the bottom of the page I have, these, I have this there for you. I have from the Targum. Who remembers what the word Targum means? Anyone? Shout it out. Translation or paraphrase of some sort. Okay. Uh, so it has to do with the translation. And so I have there from Jonathan, uh, Targum Yonatan. That's one of the Targums, one of the translations of the Hebrew Scriptures. There's many, actually. Targum Jonathan on Micah, uh, many of you are familiar from Micah 5.2. O oh, Bethle uh, Bethlehem, be least amongst the uh, cities of Judah, from you will come forth one who will be ruler for me, who coming forth is from eternity. And so, days of old, days of eternity. Whereas when they put it into their translation, they translated that verse as, one shall come forth for me, Messiah to exercise dominion over Israel. So they translate the word ruler, Mashal, in the Hebrew, as Mashiach, because they thought it referred to the Messiah. Prior to Yeshua coming, these portions were traditionally understood as messianic. In the Talmud, which is the rabbinical uh, teachings that have been accumulated, uh, it says in one portion, not Sanhedrin 93b, it says, Messiah, as it's written, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. From Isaiah 11.2. Uh, now, when I am witnessing to people and sharing the good news with them, I do not show them Isaiah 11.2. And say, so you see, it's just, it talks about Messiah. They wouldn't believe me. I, I'd have to show them from the Talmud which I probably wouldn't do. But I'm just saying that our understanding of these matters is Jewish because they understood these portions as referring to Messiah as well. Isaiah 53, Sanhedrin 98b. You already have this on your outlines already. And so my point is simply this, that the rabbinical writings are useful when dealing with people who depend on rabbinical writings. There's not many Jewish people, a small, uh, a small uh, group, comparatively speaking. Uh, Chabad, Lubavitch in this area uh, would be dependent upon rabbinical writings, and this, you could utilize these kind of uh, matters to, to share with them that our faith in, is in Yeshua as the Messiah, and that our viewpoint is Jewish, even as the Talmud uh, speaks to the issue of the Messiah in the, uh, among those same verses. Okay. In regards to the matters of prophecies of the Messiah, we believe Messiah is the focus of Scripture. 
I make no bones about it. I, I delight in him. Uh, and so this is not something different than what the rabbis spoke about as well. And so, uh, Berachot 34b uh, in the Talmud says, All the prophets prophesy only for the days of the Messiah. And so, Messiah, seeing the Messiah as the key, key, key issue of the scriptures is something that was understood by the rabbis, even as John 539 deals with it. And so, my encouragement to you be familiar with messianic prophecies. I have a few up there that are worth looking at. I would only encourage you to be, familiarize yourself with these so you could utilize them in your witness to Jewish people. Uh, and we trust that that will be a, a relevant opportunity for you. Um, I have here a bunch, you turn to page eight, if you will, page eight in your outlines. Please notice what you have there. You don't have to take furious notes, you already have it. That should be an encouragement to you. And so prophecies of the Messiah, be familiar with these matters. They could be useful in your testimony. And so this is what you have. and. Uh, in regards to Israel, we believe that God's promises are an irreducible complexity. God's word will not change. He is faithful in his promises to Israel. We believe Messiah is the hope, not the end of Israel. We believe the new covenant is the guarantee for Israel's security. We believe all Gentile believers are called to make Israel jealous for Messiah. Well, in any case, Familiarize yourself with some of the prophecies regarding Messiah because when you speak to secular Jewish people, they do not believe that Israel is a relevant discussion point. They think of it as a political issue. Uh, and so when speaking with secular Jewish people, what is a, a relevant testimony is to be able to share with them, no, this, uh, our, the scriptures are very careful on this matter uh, and therefore, uh, we believe that Israel is a, a work of God. Uh, that Israel going back to the land is, is a matter of God's opinion on the matter. And so the scriptures speak to that matter. And you have them now in your booklet there. Fair enough. Uh, any questions on uh, using prophecies uh, or any of that thing that we've covered on this session uh, regarding that matter, that we, uh, any questions or clarification needed? Erica? Uh, Debbie, you're the, you're, you're the microphone lady. You have to, uh, I know it doesn't pay well, but it's steady work. Okay. Uh, we're going to wait till the microphone gets to Erica. So for those who are downloading this, um, okay. Thank you for your uh, patience. Yeah, my, question, my question is, why the book of Maccabees is not an inspired book? Because why is it not inspired? Exactly, because when I, when I read this book, I, I, I see that everything is true and is the history for, for, for Hanukkah, and, you know? So this is my question. You know, it's not inspired for several reasons. One, the writers of Maccabees never thought they were writing scripture. They thought they were reporting history. The writers of the Maccabees never thought they were writing any scripture. It wasn't understood as scriptural at any time. It became useful for the Catholic Church in 1544 uh, at the Council of Trent to declare uh, many of those writings to be scripture. That was that was done in 1544 in order uh, to counter the, Re the Protestant Reformation. In other words, the Protestant Reformation was based upon the teaching of the scriptures that state we are justified by faith and that there is no purgatory, etc. The only place they could find purgatory is in some of those kind of writings, as you noted, uh, and therefore that's why they de then declared them to be inspired. They were not accepted as inspired by before or by anyone else. Okay? 
Good. I'm moving along then. Good question. Before we get into this next subject, I'm going to review something with you uh, so it will be fresh in your mind, uprooting false concepts. When you share with Jewish people or anyone else, you are not dealing with a blank slate. You're dealing with people who have opinions. Some of them are religious opinions. Some of them are philosophical opinions. Uh, but many times they are convinced of the opinions that they hold to. And your interaction with them will be a work of God as you uproot those opinions. For Yeshua taught us everything my Heavenly Father has not planted must be uprooted. And so we'll be looking at various matters that need to be uprooted as we interact with people. Yeshua told us, uh, Matthew 12, 34, the heart overflows into speech. People are always telling you where they stand. Uh, we've covered this in the past. I review it now in order to get into the next session. The Bible speaks of four sources of authority, or truth as you may. Uh, four sources, how people make decisions, big decisions in their life. There's usually, there is four sources the Bible speaks of, and therefore we want to address those four sources. Um, only one is legitimate, you'll probably guess that, uh, but three false sources need to be uprooted by the illegitimate one. Can you all see that little picture up there? It says uproot, Matthew 15, 13. The first area of, of authority that people hold to for making their decisions is the area of experience, experience. Uh, if they experience something, they think it is true. Well, it may be a true experience, but it doesn't mean it's true. It has nothing to do with truth. And so the Bible tells us to be careful about it. I have portions from the Tanakh uh, as well as New Covenant regarding these matters, that experience is not the basis of truth. Uh, some people may have come to faith, and therefore their early discipleship and orientation may have been in an experience-oriented group. And so they may not understand their faith apart from experience. Uh, that limits their growth, uh, since there's, we walk by faith, not by sight. So we're told our faith is going to be sometimes very different than what we sense or experience. When we're talking to people and you overhear what they're saying, if you listen carefully and they use the word feel, they're speaking of how they deal with things. They're emotionally oriented, experientially oriented, uh, and so you want to understand that when talking with them. You say, uh, to do what? Well, not to manipulate them, but to minister to them. Uh, and when people think that their experience uh, is the base of authority, I usually discuss with them, is there any time that you ever found uh, that you were misled by your experience? That something felt right to you, but it turned out not to be right. And they always can say, yes, of course, there's always been. I say, well, that's exactly the problem. Second area that people have authority in their life is the area of reason. If it seems reasonable, it must be true. The Bible tells us that that is not always the case. Uh, why? Because human reason falls short of God's understanding of anything. And so we read in Isaiah 55, verse 9, it should be 8 and 9, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Uh, it says, God's ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways higher than our ways. And so we want to understand his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Uh, his perspective may be very different than how we understand things. Uh, and if you depend upon uh, your ability to reason things out, you'll probably be led astray at some point. You say, well, what do we depend on? The word of God, obviously. That's the only base of authority that's legitimate. And so... When we talk to people who hold to that area, to reason, there's a basis, you hear them use the word think. 
quite often they think of this as the basis of truth for their life. It's the word of God that is the only basis of truth. And that's because it was revealed to us by God. It's not of human wisdom. It's not of human concoction. It has to do with what God has revealed as truth. That's why it is true. Our own reasoning is limited. On tradition, people hold to tradition as a basis of truth for their life. And so, once more, from both the Tanakh as well as the Brit Chadashah, the covenant, I have portions to show why uh, the Bible says that's not a, a true foundation uh, for your life, certainly not for your faith. Uh, and when you're talking to people who have uh, the basis tradition uh, for their decision making in their life, you hear them use the word we. What does that mean? Are they French? Not that we. It's a different we. This has to do with their identification with a community. They are representing a community uh, that, that they are part of. And so, as we understand this in your discussion with people, the only true basis of, of authority is, of course, the scriptures. Uh, and as you are interacting and talking with people, uh, and they are discussing things, just casually discussing things, they will be using words all the time that show the basis of, of their hope, their decision-making, their faith, uh, and for their life. And if you have a discerning ear, this is something that develops as you mature, a discerning ear to hear what people say. Uh, you'll hear them using words that reflect upon what they uh, have as a basis of authority in their life. For believers, we talk about him. That's mostly what I talk about. Well, there you are on that. Moving ahead now, this is a review of what we've covered before. So moving ahead, because now we want to start uh, this session. You'll notice on the next page, if you have it. If you have your, is anyone here who doesn't have a booklet of outlines? Raise your hand if you don't. I, I, I beg your pardon for not mentioning it earlier. If you don't have a booklet of outlines, raise your hand. Barry, do you have a booklet of outlines? No, you don't. I could tell from that look in your eye. Uh, Debbie, can you make sure that Barry is not left feeling inadequate? So as we get now, you'll notice this uh, session eight has to do with asking and answering questions. Asking and answering questions. Most believers are not very good at this. They're not taught. Uh, one person who's here with us this evening actually confided in me that uh, being raised up, being parented, as this person was, uh, they were told not to ask questions, that it was considered somewhat rebellious. That wasn't the word the person used, but something like that. And so they were not permitted. Uh, your, your growth will be stunted if you can't ask questions. That's how you learn. That's actually how you think. And so asking questions is like, good, good. And so uh, we want to develop relationships by asking questions. When you talk to people, if you make a statement, their response is either to accept your statement or to disagree with your statement, in which case you probably have a debate or argument on your hands. I would suggest minimizing uh, statements in all of your discussions. Minimizing statements. Because you're either going to force the person to either agree, which they may not be likely to, or to therefore disagree and therefore be turned off to any further discussion. What's a better way to witness? Ask questions. Learn about the person you're talking to. Find out where they're coming from, what they think about things. You say, why do I care what they think about things? Because you love them. I don't know if I love them. Well, then you're not ready to be a witness for the Lord because we love everybody. We care about people. We're not just trying to show people how smart we are. That's not the point of witnessing. We're developing relationship by asking questions. 
God asked the question, Adam, where are you? Why? Well, God asks a lot of questions in Scripture, as it turns out, usually to get our attention on something we're not thinking about. Moses, what's in your hand? Uh, Exodus 4.2. And so God asks questions, usually to get our attention. But asking questions is how he gets us involved in the discussion. It gets a response. It elicits a response from us. We're actually interacting with God in response to his questions. Questions get an interaction going. It gets a discussion going. It develops relationship. What do we ask? Well, here we're going to go through a list of things to ask. I'll try to address each of these as well. That's where your note-taking will be. You'll notice on page 9 you have lists of questions. We'll try to deal with some of them this evening. First one, that's an interesting question, but what do you think? And so they say to you something like, do you really believe that, that God created everything? Well, most people say yes. I would encourage you not to answer that, but rather to say, that's an interesting question. What do you think? Get them to share their opinion. No, I think that everything just kind of like came from the Big Bang. Well, you get to interact with them at that point, you know? Uh, but that's the, now you're learning about where they're coming from, what they hold to, and you're more likely to be able to address their issues more adequately. Yeshua used this approach when uh, was asked about uh, the Torah, you know, what's the most important commandments and things, Yeshua said to him, what is written in the Torah, in the law? How does it read to you? And so he got people to interact with him. When asked a question, he turned it around so that they would be interacting with him. This is what Yeshua did. This is what we can do as well respecting the other person's opinion, uh, being able to understand how they look at things, uh, and makes it a discussion, not a debate. Listen carefully. You want a discussion, not a debate. I've been involved in many, many debates as a believer. I never once won a person I was debating. In every situation, as I have noted up there, they galvanize themselves to resist anything the person they're debating is saying. Whereas when you get into a discussion, you're building a relationship. You're appreciating what the other person thinks, and you're actually able to enter in to a more interesting approach to how Messiah works in someone's life. Okay. Number two, what situation in your life makes you wonder about that? I've often found that someone will raise a question about, what do you think of, of, of someone who uh, gets drunk every weekend? <laughs> well, my answer is, what situation in your life makes you uh, wonder about that? What's going on, you know? Oh, nothing. Well, he, <laughs> really? <laughs> Someone who gets drunk every weekend just kind of popped into your head? <laughs> you know, what's happening here? So when we consider the matter, let's understand, we may think uh, uh, everything is theologically based. Most people are, for life is mostly situationally based and they try to not deal with theology at all. If you remember Yeshua sharing with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, uh, he uh, want you know, call your husband. Well, which one would be the answer to that? The poor dear had a number and none of them were her own. Uh, and so uh, practical situations that arise, problems that come up, Raising kids and a mixed marriage, living with boyfriends, all kinds of different things. Uh, all kinds of real situations of life 
underlie the questions that's involved here. Uh, I have normally found that I can understand someone's theology if I can understand their morality. What they believe about God is usually tied into their moral life or their immoral life. Uh, and so if, they, if I get to talk to them and find out what's going on, I can appreciate more of what their beliefs really are. Uh, just because of the kind of moral life or immoral life they may be living. But the point is you want to get into a discussion with the person who raises situational kind of questions. Even though you don't know if you had to guess, how would you answer? What does that have to do with? Well, people uh, would, would say to you, uh, Questions such as, uh, do you really think that hell is eternal? Or something like that. And so you might want to say to them, even though you don't know, if you had to guess, how would you answer? Uh, why? Uh, because that way you're having a discussion going and you're actually able to be more helpful to them. Usually many people, unless, uh, facts, uh, unless the facts come to a medical certainty, uh, they, people don't like to be wrong. Uh, they want to have right answers, thinking that having a right answer makes you right, and things of that sort. Uh, most people uh, want that we want to know about people how they think about things, how they think about things, uh, the facts uh, that they're not certain about. I really want to find out if they hold to experience or reason or tradition. I'm trying to find out more about their life so I can actually minister to who they are. I want to find out what their fears are, uh, how they deal with life. Uh, you say, why? When we deal with people, we minister to their fears, not facts. People will like to use facts to kind of like a fig leaf covering up all their fears and hurts and whatever else. Uh, facts are not that very helpful to people. Where they really live is where we really want to minister. We want to get into a discussion with them. Next question you have up there on your sheet. Is there any answer you won't accept and why? When I talk to people who are, yeah, sometimes uh, resistant to the good news, or somewhat resistant to the good news, uh, and they'll say something to me along the lines of, you know, I'd, please don't tell me there's only one way to heaven. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I want to get into a discussion, say, what answers won't you accept? Well, don't tell me there's only one way to heaven. Uh, why, why, why can't you accept that answer? <laughs> What's wrong with that? It sounds like a pretty good answer. Uh, why is that a problem? And so when we deal with people, uh, they have all kinds of moral screens uh, to protect them uh, and their basic assumptions about life. Uh, they may be living lives uh, that have very little to do with God very little to do with moral living or that. They, they may have all kinds of things going on. And many times they use, uh, they resist religious truth as they understand it uh, to keep themselves from feeling bad or feeling judged or things along those lines. And so when you talk with people, finding out what they won't accept uh, is important to find out what they will accept, how they're able to grab things. Uh, you know, so when people, usually, when people say to me, I can never believe there's only one way to heaven. I know where they're coming from. Because I know they think I made it up. In other words, they think I mean what I believe is the only thing that's true. My teaching that there's only one way to heaven is understood by non-believers as me saying whatever I believe is true, whatever you believe is wrong. Uh, 
That's how they understand this one way to heaven and things along those lines. When I share with them that Yeshua may have said this, they don't believe it. They don't believe it. They, don't, they think it's something that more has to, do with, has to do with me justifying my position rather than something that Yeshua actually said. Uh, can anyone yell out a verse where Yeshua said he was the only way to heaven? Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, John 14, 6. Uh, so uh, Yeshua actually spoke of this uh, in different places. And so when we talk about propositional truth, Yeshua is the only way to heaven, uh, propositional truth. It's really best understood and discussed in regards to practical activities. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, the fact that Yeshua is the only way to heaven, what difference has that made in your life? See, what people are looking for are not religious truths. They use them to, say, to protect themselves and their feelings. But they're not looking for that. They have practical, difficult, troubled lives. How has what you believe made a difference in your life? to deal with the miserable issues you have to struggle through as well. And we all do. We all have health problems, wealth problems, relationship issues. How many people have family? Raise your hand. Well, you've got problems. How does your faith make a difference when your problems? And so when we talk with people, we want to find out what they are resisting and why they're resisting it. Uh, have a discussion with them on the issues of life that they find difficult to deal with. Uh, number five, what has led you to conclude that? This is what I'm asking. What are they saying? They're saying, uh, I believe that the, the world is uh, you know, 14 billion years old. Well, what has led you to conclude that? I went to college. I took biology. I, I, what, are you crazy? This is, this is the facts of life, buddy. <laughs> but why do you believe that's true? I mean, you, you don't look like you're 14 billion years old, so you're accepting somebody else's statement on the matter, and you think that they are right, right? So you're having this. What has led you to conclude that? I think it's fine for, uh, for people to sleep together before they're married. No big deal. What has led you to conclude that? It sounds like you're convinced of it, but what has led you to be convinced of it? What's go what makes you think it's, that's true? Why are you depending on Once more, I'm listening for other things. What am I listening for? Remember the four base of authority. I'm listening carefully to what they're basing their opinions on, what they're basing the decisions on, what they're basing their moral truths on. I want them to say, well, it just feels right to me. I mean, you know, if, if people care for each other, they sleep together, that's all. It's a way of showing love and intimacy. No big deal. Uh, it's, and so, and, and why do you think that, uh, what led you to conclude that? I, 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 my whole life, this is how I've always felt about it. Well, okay, let's understand that. What word have they used? Felt. Uh, this is how I think about things. Uh, this is how my family always dealt with things. We issue. I'm listening for those matters so I can discuss the basis of authority which brings them to make conclusions. Oh, pardon me. And so, uh, people who are relativists, all things are relative, uh, usually trust in experience. Uh, that changes from situation to situation. Romans 7, 14, 25 deals with some of these kind of issues. Uh, as we consider number six, uh, what information do you think would cause you to change your mind? You say, well, what do you mean? Well, I remember talking to uh, a, a Jewish agnostic not very long ago now, recently, and he said he could never accept creation. And so I said, well, what kind of, inf I used it, what kind of information would cause you to change your mind? And he said, 
what information is there, period? I mean, there's no facts on your side. I said, well, perhaps there are. If I could show you some reasonableness on the issue of creation, would that be something, I mean, what information would you accept? And so it's important for people to think what they're willing to consider, what they're willing to think about. Uh, they uh, take for granted there's nothing somebody else can say that would change their mind. They can't, it's like the dark side of the moon. They can't believe there's anything there because they haven't seen it. And so uh, they assume there's nothing to be discussed. But it becomes vitally important for us to raise the issues for discussion purposes, uh, areas they have never thought about before, uh, new ways of looking to matters. Uh, if they ever come to a place of admitting that they don't know everything, uh, that's an area, an opportunity to be able to share some kind of biblical information. Let me mention something to you that might be helpful. Your job is not to win souls. That's actually God's job. Your job is to plant seeds. Water seeds at times. Once in a while you may there be there when the fruit falls off the tree and hits you in the head. But your job is actually to plant seeds. Uh, to share a bit of spiritual matters uh, that gives them something to think about. Uh, and so I would, uh, I would like to alleviate your stress that you may have as you think of people who are impossible to bring to faith. It's not your job. It's actually God's job. Our job in the Good News Ministry is to plant seeds, uh, to share the good news as best we can, with what opportunities. And so, what information do you think uh, would cause you to change your mind? Uh, with people who actually are, believe in the scientific principle, it's been my experience that they're very prejudiced on the matter. They don't think there's anything that science itself uh, cannot uh, prove. And therefore, they don't think there's other information uh, that, that would change their minds about the matter. Uh, what's the strongest argument for those who disagree with you? When talking with someone, many times you may not be the first person they've discussed uh, these matters with. And so, uh, you may want to say to them, you've talked about this with other people, have you? Uh, what's, what's the best argument you ever heard one of those people give you? Uh, and so you may, uh, may find out that uh, they've heard something that's similar to what you hold to already, or was going to say anyway. Uh, and so that is a helpful thing, uh, because the strongest argument that they consider may not be the strongest argument. It may be how they look at things. In other words, let's say uh, I am a, a traditionalist and you're trying to share Messiah with me. And someone says, well, what's the strongest argument you've ever heard? Well, I heard it was pretty strong that an Orthodox man had come to faith uh, in light of what Torah teaches. I thought that was a pretty strong argument, though I didn't accept the fact that Yeshua was the Messiah. And so that, that's a very helpful kind of thing. If I know that, uh, why? because I understand where the person's coming from, what he considers to be a strong argument. I may not consider it a strong argument, but he may be considering it a strong argument. And so someone who's impressed with people who are sincerely involved uh, with the poor. Uh, I don't know uh, if you're involved. I try to do as much as I can uh, to minister to the poor. And you say, well, why do you do that? Because they're poor, would probably be my answer. Uh, and so I try to minister to them. The uh, Bible teaches me to care about the disenfranchised and to care about the poor. And so I try to help where I can. Uh, and so someone says, oh, what have you ever, you know, 
What's a strong? That might be a very strong argument, though I don't do it to be a witness to somebody else, <laughs> to some third party or something. Uh, but they may find that to be something that's quite attractive to the faith, that the faith actually has people who care about the poor. <laughs> I, so, so you never know what would be a strongest argument for the other person until you ask, what do you think would be the strongest argument you've ever considered before? And there are many people uh, I've interacted with who are quite smitten with the issues of sincerity and integrity. Uh, they really, even if they can't believe what you believe, they actually respect someone who is sincere and has integrity. Uh, so it becomes a, a stronger uh, argument and they're less likely to disagree. Um, <laughs> very, <laughs> this is a good one. <laughs> if everyone held that view, what would society look like? <laughs> and so people <laughs> who jaywalk <laughs> are hoping they're the only ones <laughs> getting away with it. <laughs> if everyone was jaywalking, we'd have mass murder in the streets, you know. And so <laughs> sinners want to be the exception. <laughs> Their hope is that they're exceptional. Someone who goes through a red light <laughs> is kind of hoping no one else is taking them up on the subject. <laughs> Life would be quite, quite, quite strange if everyone did that like that. And so, uh, thieves, <laughs> how the thieves know it's wrong to steal? <laughs> they don't want anyone stealing from them. <laughs> and in other words, thieves live in a world where they want society to be honest. <laughs> they want to be the thief. You have to be honest. <laughs> you understand the role you play? And so all of society can't be made up of thieves for their system to work. <laughs> and so people who live in a relativistic uh, world, uh, they, they only succeed in an absolute structure. They, people who tell me they don't believe in absolutes, I usually answer by saying, are you absolutely sure? I don't want to be cute, but it usually makes them think that maybe they're not right because they can't be absolutely sure if there's no absolutes. Hello, because there may, there may be absolutes. And so they live in a world where they want to be an exception. When people tell me that they do something that is odd, something that is not considered the norm, they usually are describing a life that is an exception. Uh, and they need to kind of uh, understand uh, that there's other things for them to consider because they can't be the norm. Otherwise, society is weird. Uh, and so uh, when nothing is absolutely right or wrong, then, then, then sin is right. If there are no absolutes, sin is right. But it could be worse for children. Uh, anyone ever hear of NAMBLA? Raise your hand if you ever heard of NAMBLA. You heard of NAMBLA? Uh, it's an evil thing. North American Man-Boy Love Association. It's about pedophiles. It's an association of pedophiles. Um, and they're evil people who are just strangely wicked. Uh, but convinced that they are really loving children. They're wrong. If all society was like them, it would be hell on, it would be worse than hell. Just the most awful thing to be. And so the issue of absolutes is something you want to get the discussion around to, uh, as is appropriate. Uh, if you found that you were wrong, what's at risk? What's at risk? Uh, most people are living lives uh, that have a lot of sin uh, and not, not being found out is very important to them. And so what would change if, uh, if they were wrong? 
what would change if they were wrong? And so uh, people raise false or phony objections uh, <coughs> and, and smoke screens. They put up a, a screen to try to fool you. Uh, it's what the woman, uh, the Samaritan woman tried to do, changing the subject to religion. Uh, we believe this mountain, the Jews think Jerusalem. She tried to get it off into theological the smoke screen. Uh, and so people try to uh, protect their corrupt morality with questions of theology. Uh, Messiah uh, actually, it turns out, wants to help hurting people. Uh, People find that hard to understand. If they are living in sin, if they have all kinds of sinful, uh, moral, horrible moral issues, uh, being found out sounds like the worst thing, uh, and maybe actually some illegalities involved. Something we need to pray about and therefore present ourselves as uh, people who are here to help and not hurt others. Uh, most people don't understand that. But we are not here to hurt anybody. And we need to present ourselves accordingly. But there may be a great loss. Uh, one man who prayed to receive the Lord here at Hope of Israel didn't last very long. Broke my heart. Uh, because he has a ga he head of a gambling operation in town. Uh, sports betting and things like that. Uh, and... <laughs> He could not stop thinking about how bad it was. <laughs> In other words, there was a lot at risk for him. His whole business world would go down the tubes. Uh, the house he was paying off. His whole world would change uh, if he took seriously the claims of Messiah. Uh, I tried to co comfort him, encourage him as best I could, but eventually, he just talked himself out of the whole deal, you know. Another person did the same thing, uh, prayed to receive the Lord. But because they did not think they could ever give up smoking, they turned their back on Messiah. Even though I said to the person, I said, don't worry about that. God will help you, if, uh, you know, he can help you with things, don't worry about that because they couldn't imagine their life without smoking. Can you imagine? Uh, so there are many things that people will not be willing to give up, and that's the reason why they resist the faith. And so you want to be able to ask, uh, if, if in fact he is the Messiah, and you weren't right about that, what's at risk in your life? What would change? What would change in your life? Finally, if, uh, if that is what Messiah said, would you rule out the possibility it's true? Uh, so I have people asking me usually uh, to, to prove, they want to prove to themselves how dumb I am. And it's not hard to prove. Uh, and so they will say to me things like, do you believe that I'm going to hell? And, and, and so they expect me to come up with an answer like most people and say, yes, I believe if you don't trust in Yeshua, you're going to hell. In which case, I've just proven to them how stupid I am. <laughs> because they don't think there's any facts on the matter. They think I made up this stuff, or whatever they think. And so, uh, what is strange to them is to find out what the Bible actually says. That our faith is based upon scripture, not our opinions. It's based on the word of God, not what we understand as the most reasonable way to live. Um, and so the truth of what scripture says is usually a shock to most people. Uh, the margin of possibility. I, I look for people to be able to say to me, I say to them, do you think it's possible? I often talk about possibility. Because I want them to consider it as possible. Because it's at that point where something is possible Faith, faith can grow at that point. Where it is possible, faith can grow. If they will not rule it out completely, faith can grow in that little tiny bit of possibility. Uh, that's where faith always grows, as a matter of fact. Um, even if it may not seem probable to someone, the question is, is it possible? 
reasonable people will sometimes say, well, I guess it could be possible. That's what I'm looking for, uh, et cetera. Uh, our time is up. You'll notice it's only half a page. There's two pages, by the way, I believe, if I'm, cor if I'm correct. No, only one page. Um, but nonetheless, we'll be doing a whole lot more next week. Uh, we're going to stop here. If you have children, uh, one of you needs to go get your children, and the rest can raise their hands for questions. I'll open it up right now before we close in prayer for any questions. If you're live streaming, uh, please uh, use the chat box to send a question in. We'll try to address that as well. Anyone with any questions, raise your hand if you will. All right, we are seated. For clarification, for comfort, for moving your mus jaw muscles. Uh, down here at the front, Debbie, we have someone with their hand raised. Either they just want to stretch their arm or they may actually have a question. We'll soon find out. Uh, right up to your mouth, Jody. Okay. Um, last week you talked about in the first century yes. that tradition changed by a rabbi called Rashi. Why did he do that? Yeah, he, that was the 11th century. Oh, Rashi yeah. was in the 11th. But why would he do that? Why would he do that? Well, why deals with maybe his motive for doing that. It seems, since he's dead a thousand years now, or close to it, um, but looking back on his writings, it seems he was trying to protect the greater Jewish community from the onslaught of what he saw as vicious Christianity, who were utilizing Isaiah 53 in his mind to justify their actions towards Jews. Uh, and so that would be my guess, that he was protecting our people as best he could by reinterpreting uh, Isaiah 53 so believers like myself could not utilize it to prove Yeshua is the Messiah. Uh, in other of his writings, there's writings he did, a uh, commentary on the Talmud, in which he agrees with the Talmudic writers about Isaiah 53, referring to Messiah. But in his commentary on Isaiah 53, he actually says it deals with Israel, not the Messiah. Uh, so he has two different opinions on it, but that doesn't strike me as odd. Okay? Yes, sir. Up, oh, Debbie, hold it. I've got to get the microphone to you. You, you know, it's like something isn't real unless it's posted on Facebook. You don't have a question without a microphone. You know, so this way people who are live streaming can hear your question as well. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, in question, I have tried to uh, talk with those. Right up to your mouth. Talk, yep. I tried to talk with those who uh, I encountered along the way. And I find out talking to them, they don't have the word of God in the house of Bible. Right. And it's difficult to try to talk to them and express what God is like. Yeah. Okay, so rather than having an indifference with them, I leave it. Yeah. Is that the best thing to handle? Is that the best way to handle that? Well, if, it depends how many tools you have in your toolkit. Well, I have a lot of tools, but oh, rather, there you go. rather than getting into indifference with uh -huh. them, I uh, let it go for the time being, and then if I should, if they should come yeah. to me and ask me, yeah, then I'm willing to help them. I understand, but it's it's difficult. It's a difficult job when you meet people. That it can be difficult. Them, I certainly understand and that. Their family doesn't teach them uh -huh. the way. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that, Debbie. Yeah, um, yeah. And so when we talk to people who don't have much of a Bible basis in their life, Bible in the home, or anything of that sort. Uh, most people are biblically illiterate these days. Uh, so it's not uncommon at all. Uh, I had some people come for trick or treat, and I love to give out tracts and things like that. And so I said to the bunch of kids who were at my doorway, and I said, name two of the Ten Commandments. And so they yelled out things like, freedom of speech. Uh, because people don't know anything. They just, they're biblically illiterate. Uh, they're not taught these things at all anymore. And so if we're going to be a testimony to people, as I've noted during this hour, uh, we're going to have to have discussions with them 
that's not based on their understanding of Bible, but based on discussions uh, that get us uh, to address the real issues of their life. So I appreciate the problem, but you're certainly right about that. Certainly hard when they don't have a Bible. Any other questions before we close in prayer? Let's pray. <clears throat> Avina, we thank you so much for the salvation that is ours. Thank you, Lord, for loving us with an everlasting love and caring for us uh, now and forever. And Lord, we deal with a world that really does not know the Word of God or cares about such matters, but you care about them. So we pray that your love would constrain our hearts and so that we might love them and care about them and want to develop a relationship with people through discussions so we might be able to address the real issues of life for how your word addresses our real issues. So guide us in this process to be your living testimony in Messiah's name. Amen.